This episode is brought to you by the Boneyard Huskies Club. The Boneyard Huskies Club empowers athletes while providing UConn fans with access to exclusive community, utility, and rewards. The Boneyard Huskies Club is excited to announce the next collection of student-athlete collectibles, which grant club membership privileges, will feature UConn men's basketball players, and drop on January 26, 2023. For more information, go to BoneyardHuskiesClub.com. That's Huskies with a Y-Z at the end. BoneyardHuskiesClub.com. Okay, so we're about the halfway point of the college basketball season. So joining me today, we've got Daniel Conley of the UConn blog to fill us in on all things UConn women's basketball, which there certainly has been no shortage of news around this year. Yeah, it's been uh, every time you think that it's finally going to start getting back to normal, it like just somehow seems to keep getting weirder. (laughs) I mean, this season has just been a complete roller coaster. Take me through what it's been like from your point of view and covering this team and just all the ups and downs you've already been through. And again, we're only halfway through. I know. I mean, with all the injuries they had last year, you figure, okay, like weird things happen. You get through it. (laughs) Then you get to this summer. And you're looking at the team and you're like, wow, this is going to be a really good team. You get Paige back. AZ should be a lot better than she was as a freshman. Then like you look at some of the other pieces, if Aaliyah can make a leap, if Dorka can really settle in. And then you just start going down the list and it's like, well, it's not even a matter of like, oh, who's going to step up and fill the void left by these seniors. It's like, where are they going to play all these people? Because they have so many different pieces. (laughs) And then, you know, one day you're, on a hike in North Carolina on vacation and you finish up and you pull out your phone and you see that Paige Beckers has torn her ACL and uh, she's out for the season. And uh, just like that, everything that you thought about this team gets upended. Yeah. And then a couple weeks, months later, a little while later, you find out Ice Brady is out for the year, one of their top freshmen. And then, okay, well, that's probably it there. You know who they're going to have. You're going to get into the season and this is the group you're going to work with. And then impossibly the injuries end up being worse this year so far yeah. than they were at any point last year. So now it just feels like we're living in groundhog day where every single game that comes, okay, who's going to get injured? Who's going to be missing next game? And how are they going to have to deal with this? So it's just been every single game has been different because it's just been a rotating cast of characters. All things considered, when you look at this season so far in the grand scheme of the, you know, everything, um, people getting injured and all of that. Where would you uh, where would you say that this team has kind of been in terms of the expectations you had for them once you kind of set them in the preseason, knowing there wasn't going to be Paige? Yeah, I think we felt coming in pretty firmly that it was going to be they weren't going to be as good as or it was it was impossible to expect them to be as good as South Carolina and Stanford. That was a very clear one, too. But then there was a large tier of secondary teams behind those two that seemed like UConn was going to fit into and they really have they've played the toughest schedule in the country they've got some really good wins under their belt and they've done a lot of it without two of their best players Dorky Uhas missed a big chunk of the year and we didn't know at the time when she was out how important she was going to be it's only been since she returned that have we started to see how good she really is and then we saw how good AZ Fudd was at the beginning of the year and now yep. she's been out for an extended stretch got back and is now out again. So considering just if you looked at the season so far, even disregarding who they've had, only having two losses playing the toughest schedule in the country, I think you'd come away pretty happy with that. And considering your two losses, one of which AZ FUD went out in that game, right? Immediately completely the whole game. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other game, you didn't have anyone. There was no AZ. There was no Nika Mule. Uh, I don't believe Dorka Juhas was back at that point. Like when Enish Betancourt is your starting point guard in a game, you should really lower your expectations. And they only lost by seven. So I think it was a lot more concerning for Maryland that they only beat this that UConn team by seven points than it was that UConn lost a game. If anything, UConn is not a moral victory school or program. That was a moral victory because of the way they played. And then they've been playing really well recently. It seems like they figured out how to play without AZ. They got her back, kind of plugged her right in. Even when she was out, I thought arguably their best performance of the year was this past Tuesday against Seton Hall. So yeah, of everything that's happened, I think it's hard to really find too many things to be upset with. I'm going to throw out 
Paige and AZ here, so you cannot answer with either of those two. But okay. when you talk about all of the injuries of this team, whose injury do you think has had the biggest impact on this team? And again, taking Paige and AZ out of the equation here. I think, you know, she only missed one game in there, but when Nika Mule wasn't out on the floor for this team, they were, I mean, turnovers have been a problem all season long, but you're talking about major, major turnover problems. Almost cost them the Princeton game, definitely cost them the Maryland game. I mean, if they gave up like five less turnovers, it, it was a very thin margin that they could have, if they cut down on those turnovers against Maryland, it would have looked a lot different. Even as she kind of worked her way back and even wasn't back to 100%, it's still been an issue. So they've been lucky in one sense that, you know, most of the other injuries besides the major ones haven't kept players out too long. So they've only had to roll, you know, two, three. I'd say like Caroline Ducharme and Ayanna Patterson are some of the longer ones that they've dealt with. But, you know, Dorka was out and Aaliyah Edwards played really well. Right now... Caroline and Ayana are out, as I just mentioned, and Aubrey Griffin and Lou Lopez Seneschal. Like, they just kind of mix and match with whoever they have. But that equation really changes when Nika's not out there because they don't really have a true point guard they can turn to behind her. Enish Betancourt has actually been a lot better than I expected her to be and has proven herself to at least be capable of coming into the game and you know not having it all fall apart around right. her. A kid who is going to go to a junior college nine days before the semester began like yeah doing pretty well there so yeah no nika this team's in trouble and you could really see it when she missed that time earlier i was excited in the offseason when they got lou, lou lopez seneschal i'd seen what she had done at fairfield how do you feel like she's fit into this team because it seems like she's she's had a major impact and has just been very successful uh in how she's performed for them so far yeah i mean where is this team without lou lopez seneschal i was just talking about this with someone like they're probably ranked, but I don't think they're a top 10 team. And it's it would have been a very ugly season so far. She's the only player on the team that has reached double figures in every single game, which part of that is she has actually played in every single game. Yeah. There's a very limited <laughs> number of people who have you actually played that. that. Yeah. But she's just been so consistent. And I think if you looked at the range of possibilities when she committed, I think there is a pretty decent sized possibility that she just doesn't do anything and the leap from Fairfield to UConn ends up being too large there's a chance that you know sometimes she has it against maybe some of these lesser tier biggie schools yeah but really struggles against the top teams but I don't think there's any outcome that you could have expected out of Luloba Seneschal when she committed than what she's giving you right now because she is so good for you every single night She's just a true scorer. She shoots really, really well. She's one of the best three-point shooters in the country. She hits free throws a ton, and she can just score in a variety of ways. So when you're talking about a team that hasn't had AZ Fudd and Caroline Ducharme, who's been a big scorer, has been out, and Dorka Yuhuahas, who has put up a lot of points since she's been back, missed time, just that consistency from her. You know, every single game, you're going to get probably 15 to 20 points, and you can plan your entire game plan around that because you know she's going to give it to you. She's so consistent. She's such a veteran. It's just been, I, I think you could, even, you could even make an argument that already she's proven herself to be the best transfer in UConn history. Avina Westbrook might have the larger sample size there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Azrae Stevens was really good too, but we saw they didn't need Azrae Stevenson, Stevens. She was just a very nice compliment when she was here, but Without Lou, this team is maybe not dead in the water, but their paddle's broken. When you look at the the returners from last year's team, who's made the biggest jump, in your opinion, from, from last year to this year? Oh, it's definitely Aaliyah Edwards. I mean, there's there's no shortage of options there. Nika Mule yeah. has more assists this season already. We're January 19th. She already has more assists this season than she had in her first two years combined. Yeah. She's the nation's assist leader. Like She's been un unbelievable. Dorky Uhas was a consistent third option in the front court, and now she's practically a double-double a night. Like Those two have been unbelievable coming back, but the easy answer is Aaliyah Edwards. She's gone from having a good freshman year to a disappointing sophomore year 
to having an all American type season as a junior. I don't know if she's actually going to get that because there's a lot of really good front court players this year, but she brings the same thing every single night. And I think some of the things that I've been most impressed with is especially your freshman year and even last year to a degree, it felt like a lot of her points came off putbacks. She'd get an offensive rebound, she'd put mm-hmm. it back and she'd score and she could get 10 points a game that way. And that was great. And all the credit to her. And occasionally she'd step out and she'd hit like an elbow jumper or they'd get it into her against a smaller opponent and she'd score that way. This year, they make a point of getting her the ball and she can beat teams by getting to the basket. She's shown a fadeaway jumper that she can score with. Her elbow jumper has been a really, really consistent shot. We just saw against Seton Hall that she can get out and transition and score that way. I mean, she's their anchor in the front court but she's also athletic enough to essentially be a wing the way that she plays with Canada basketball. So she's been able to score in such a variety of ways. And another really important factor is she's staying out of foul trouble. That was a huge issue for her the first two years. And even look at another really good junior, Cameron Brink. It's not like that's been solved for her as a junior, but not only is that important because it continues to help her take advantage of the way that she's playing but But with the depth the depth they need her out there (laughs) yeah exactly Dorka Juhas wasn't there for a big chunk of the year so yeah she's your only trusted post option down there and she's been on the floor as much as they've really needed her to I'm going to take a quick break from the interview to tell you about my friends at Martin Rosol's Meats this fourth generation Connecticut family business produces kielbasa hot dogs sausages and deli meats using Martin Rosol's very own original recipes Their products can be found in grocery stores, delis, restaurants, and hot dog stands throughout the state. And if you're looking for your fill right away, check out their retail store in New Britain. For more information, visit martinrosalsinc.com and go support a UConn fan-owned business. And now, back to the interview. As you look at these injuries, and you you mentioned how how Caroline's injury has been one of the longer ones, what what do you hear is the latest in in terms of her getting back to basketball activities and and maybe getting back to playing in a game? Yeah, I, I don't feel great about her status because for whatever reason, her head has been a magnet this year. Yeah. She had, so apparently, I think Maria Marino said that she ran into a screen in practice, but it was like the two previous games, she took a shot to the head during the game and needed to put ice on it. So she had a head injury last year that really derailed her freshman year. Once she went out with that, she returned, but she was never the same player. And Gino said at the end of the year that he could really tell she was a lot more hesitant to get into, into the lane and where she might get whacked. Yeah. Then you know, this happens and it's already been an extended stretch that she's been out. And the last couple of games, I noticed that she's had earplugs in, which, you know, Hmm. I don't know anything, but you kind of connect the dots there and you sense that there's a sensitivity to noise. And then you also add in the fact that Ayanna Patterson is also in concussion protocol and she started to make her way back we haven't gotten really any firm update on Caroline. And I think it's hard to give a firm update about Caroline because concussions are just so tricky. And it's, it's not a muscle or a, you know, a return from a fracture or something. It's yeah. 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 So she could be feeling okay today, but she could still be feeling that same way in two weeks and there hasn't been progress or she could be feeling horrible today. And in three days, all of a sudden she feels a lot better. It, they're just so weird. And I don't know it with concussions. It's tricky, but the earplugs thing is really a red flag in my eyes about this might take a little Mm -hmm. bit of time. I think one of the other trying parts of this season has been Gino and, you know, his need to take some absence going through some tough times, you know, been under the weather himself. How do you feel like he's been able to, you know, kind of withstand all of this, this season? I mean, when they announced he was going to be out for a little bit, I don't think I expected him back quite as quickly as he made it back. Were you surprised to see him back as quick as he was following that statement? Um, And then just how do you think he's handled everything this year? Because it's been a tough year. Yeah, it has. I didn't really know what to expect when he'd be back. I mean, they said he was going to be out through Christmas and he was back that first time we saw them after Christmas. So that kind of lined up. But I also didn't think he was himself when he got back. Like Gino loves to make jokes and he loves to, you know, poke at people and Mm -hmm you know, be himself. And he really clearly wasn't himself. Like he will just talk and talk. And sometimes it's really hard to figure out like 
is he just pausing or did he finish his answer? Like, can I ask the next one? But that span between those two absences, it was like, yep, here's my answer. I'm just boom, boom over. Like you could very much tell there was a start and a finish. He wasn't, he just didn't seem like himself. So when that news came through that he was going to miss time again, or at least that he was going to be out for that Butler game, that really didn't surprise me a whole lot just because I didn't feel like, or I felt like it was probably connected to that same thing that kept him out the first time. Yeah. And then he pretty much confirmed that when he talked last Saturday, where it was all tied with the death of his mother and he had trouble sleeping. And then when he had trouble sleeping, he wanted to go to work to try and get away from it all. And then it all just kind of snowballed on him. And he got to a point where he realized like, okay, I need mm-hmm. to step away because this is not going well. And he was adamant that, no, I'm, I'm better. I gave myself time to, you know, rejuvenate, get back, process this grief. And from the first time we talked with him or the first time we saw him, I'd say at St. John's, he still didn't seem like himself, but then the next time we talked with him, you could see it coming through a little more. And then the last time we saw him, I think that was Sunday against Georgetown. He really seemed like himself, I thought. And then watching some of the video from Seton Hall, it feels like he's back to normal. So I feel pretty good that he's making progress. And even if he's not 100% of the way there, there's been a very clear and positive change in him from even just a week ago. Yeah, no, that's that's great to see that he's been able to, you know, take that time away. And I think one thing that probably makes it a little bit easier to step away, too, is when you, when you have someone like Chris Daly waiting to, uh, to to fill in there. I mean, what do you think of the job she's done? I mean, it's like an effortless takeover when it when it went from Gino to Chris. So what are your thoughts on, on what she's been able to do? Yeah, I mean, she's incredible. And the fact that she's been there the entire time Gino has when the book is written about UConn women's basketball, if the person who's writing it is writing it correctly, like Gino certainly deserves the majority of the credit, but like, it's not like CD is going to get a small chunk. It's she's not just any other assistant. She's so crucial in the team bonding experiences. And that's just something that's really noticeable covering this team is how much this team and past teams get along with each other. And they're all really good kids, which is obviously a focus of their recruiting, but they're always so close and they always talk about being close and you always see the players come back and they go visit former players that are playing in the WNBA. They all took a trip down to Brooklyn to go watch Avina Westbrook last summer. So she's a really crucial part in that, you know, she's a really good balance to Gino because once Gino was back, some of the players were saying that, yeah, we, we missed when, you know, you just hear these little comments off to the side, whereas <laughs> CD certainly had a little bit more of a softer touch. So they're such a good compliment for each other. Absolutely. And, yeah. And it's just that institutional, institutional knowledge. I mean, Jamel Elliott and Morgan Valley both played here, obviously now have both coached here, both have been head coaches. So I'm sure that if they had to hand over the reins to them, UConn would still be, okay. be fine and yeah. keep rolling along. But Chris Daly is just so integrated in what they do. And she knows Gino inside and out. And she has that experience being a head coach. I mean, it's not like she's just won games against scrubs. She's won two Big East tournaments. Right. And those weren't in the days. Well, one of them wasn't in the days where UConn gets crowned the Big East champion when the season starts, like right. it has been recently. <laughs> So the first UConn Big East championship came with Chris Daly at the helm. You know, the, some of the games she's coached this season haven't been easy. So it's just 18 and 0 is incredible. And I think we're just continuing to see how valuable Chris Daly is to the program. And if anyone had forgotten how important she is, this season has really served as a reminder, just how invaluable she is to the program. I know there's so much up in the air, so this might be a, a trickier one, but I, I'll wrap with this one. If you had to take a look at the team, um, you know, as they stand right now, you hope you get AZ, you know, and, and Caroline and, and everyone else back. Um, what do you think the ceiling is for this team? And then, you know, on the flip side, what, what's kind of the lowest point you could see this team being, just depending on how things shake out? Okay, well, is the lowest point, like, the entire roster gets injured and they have to pull up at the NCAA tournament because they physically don't have the players. Like, 
I'm not saying that's what I think might happen, but the way this season has gone, that very much feels like the lowest point. But if they have everyone healthy, I have a really hard time seeing this team not being in the final four. And by healthy, I mean, you get everyone back, let's say February 1st, AZ's back and stays healthy. And maybe even if you only get Caroline back by Valentine's day, you just have enough lead in into the postseason where you have everyone and you can start to figure out who your pieces are and what's going to work going into the postseason. But if they can ever get their health to turn and have everyone, I have a really hard time not seeing this team get to the final four. And, you know, maybe if things break poorly and you end up in South Carolina's region or something like that, then maybe the elite eight is where this team falls, but they're too talented and they they're playing too well, even without AZ to lose to a sweet 16 yeah. caliber team. I mean, they've played some of those teams. I think Creighton's a sweet 16 caliber team. I think they haven't played Villanova, but I think Villanova could be that level or even earlier this season, you know, they killed NC state with AZ FUD yeah. and I still think they could beat them without her. And that's a sweet 16 team. And it also helps that there's not really, yeah, South Carolina's number one, but it's not like South Carolina has just been an unbelievably dominant. Everything is clicking. All cylinders are cylinders are firing. They've got their own problems that they got to figure out. And I don't think they're unflappable. Unfla- I'm really interested if UConn can get healthy for that February 5th game, how yeah. they match up. Get but, that barometer, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, this team is really good. And if they play the way they should, Assuming, let's just even say they have their big guns and they're really important pieces. I think it would be, it would take a really bad performance from them and a really good performance from who they play to lose in the Elite Eight if they're not a, I think they end the season as a one seed just based on who they play and Mm -hmm. the way the rest of the season goes. So if you're a one seed, I have a hard time seeing them losing to a two seed in there. Or even that two seed getting there with how many upsets there's been and the ceiling the ceiling is a national championship and you know i think we kind of take it for granted sometimes that oh yeah that's always uconn's goal but the year that got ended by the covid outbreak like they were not going to a final four they would have needed like half the teams to have something happen to not to win that national championship even the year they lost to arizona I don't really know if that team could have beaten Stanford. That Stanford team was really good. And UConn had plenty of flaws that year. Last year, UConn could have won the national championship if things went a little better for them. And if Dorka Juhas doesn't fracture her wrist and AC doesn't get sick and Paige isn't hurt and, you know, you could go down the list. So I really feel like we've seen this team play at a level that arguably they have played the most consistent high level of any team south carolina's had its downs stanford lost to usc lsu hasn't played anyone better than southwest community college like (laughs) uconn has played a tough schedule and for the most part there's been one or two duds in there but they've played at a very high level and when they have everyone there's no reason that another team in the country is clearly better and once you get to the final four i think we've really seen in this post stewie era that it all comes down to taking it one game at a time, not to Absolutely. drop a cliche in here, but look at last year's Stanford game and Stanford didn't play well and UConn played well and they got to the final or look at every single other UConn loss since between then. Right. That they didn't play well. The other team played really well. So you get there and who knows who else is going to be with you there. South Carolina didn't exactly have a great NCAA tournament. I think they scored 40 points in one game and one or 50 points. Like, they could get knocked out. Stanford could get knocked out. Like you it's never the fun of the tournament, happen. right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. I, there's no reason barring health strictly basketball wise that this team shouldn't at least be in contention for a national championship. And then you just get there and see how the chips fall. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Daniel really appreciate the time. Uh, everyone check out his coverage at the, the UConn blog. It's fantastic. Uh, get you through the rest of the year. So we'll have to have you back on at the uh, end of the season. We'll, we'll see how, how you lived up to the, uh, to the ceiling take there. Absolutely. Always happy to hop on. Awesome. Thanks so much for coming on. Yep.